Um, I just want to uh, follow up on a couple of things Maury said and, and uh, thank our sponsors for this meeting. It's the fourth annual meeting and, and it doesn't happen by accident. And so as you um, mill around today, if, if you have a chance to stop by the, the front table and, and thank uh, Laura and, and Chelsea and Bethany and, and Sarah who really make all this happen. Michael and Maury, you know, they're back there pulling the strings and they do a great job, but, but those are the people who really make this happen year over year. So please, uh, sometime today, just stop by and, and thank them for all that they do. All right, is this, uh, this on? Great. So welcome to our first panel. Um, we had uh, an entertaining conversation last night. Michelle, why don't you slide your chair around a bit so I don't have to okay. look right over Oz. Um, and, and we decided just to start off with a brief introduction of, of ourselves and then uh, maybe talk a little bit about the, um, the cancer immunotherapy space. So Oz, you want to start? Sure. Good morning, everybody. My name's uh, Osman Azam. Everybody calls me Oz. Uh, I have the privilege of uh, leading the Salon Gene Therapies business at Novartis. Uh, this was a, an organization that was formed just, uh, just nearly two years ago. And uh, prior to that, uh, we had uh, been obviously very actively involved in the cell and gene therapy space. But the real catalyst for our creation was really the CAR-T therapies and the investments and the collaboration that we did with the University of uh, Pennsylvania and Children's Hospital of Philadelphia with a view to bringing these transformative therapies to market. Great. Welcome. Michelle? Yes. Hello. My name is uh, Michel Sadlin. I'm the director of the Center for Cell Engineering at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center here in New York, which is about eight blocks away from here. Um, I um, trained in medicine and then uh, at MIT as a postdoctoral fellow, um, putting together the rudiments of gene transfer uh, to, to apply them to T cells. And so when I came to Sloan Kettering, uh, we established a program to develop cell therapies. It, mostly focuses on immunotherapies, but we're also interested in various forms of uh, regenerative medicine. We have projects uh, to generate dopaminergic neurons, expand cord blood, and we're now studying iPS cells for a, a variety of immune applications. Um, we've been in the CAR T cell field, I can say, from the very first uh, really minutes of its existence. And um, in particular, in the 90s, we identified a target uh, CD19, we thought it would be a good target to try out this technology uh, in patients. And I think everyone here knows that we and other centers uh, then pursued this in the clinic, which really brings us to, to where we are today. Great. And so if we could maybe use, Michelle, that as a, just a, a stepping stone for the, those people who have been under a rock for the last two years. Uh, to briefly describe maybe uh, the CAR T space and, and the, just the basic building blocks of what goes into making that product. Okay. With a very, very brief uh, yeah. historical introduction, then perhaps. Um, in the 50s, the first transplants were performed. Uh, patients with leukemias or lymphomas were getting lots of chemotherapy, and they were getting bone marrow transplants to re rescue their. their hematopoiesis that had been destroyed by those chemotherapies. It was thought that it was a regenerative medicine, you're getting stem cells to make blood again. But then investigators found out that it was also an immunotherapy, that those grafts contained T cells, and it was actually the T cells that finished the, the job started by the chemotherapy to eliminate the cancer, but not completed by the drugs alone. At the same time, in immunology, people were working out what was called adoptive transfers, you know, from mice, bearing mice, bearing tumors, you could take their T cells, transfer them to another animal, and sometimes transfer the protection or even cure some mice. There was a first wave of uh, cell therapies, for those of you who know, know lymphokine activator killer cells, DLI, and those were, um, gave occasional results but were not very specific. Then two technologies were introduced. One referred to as tumor infiltrating lymphocytes, TILs, and the other one making use of virus specific T cells. People by then had realized that you really need specific T cells to achieve meaningful results without toxicity. Unlike the bone marrow transplant situation, and I know we'll talk about allogeneic T cells later, that's why I'm saying this, where if you, if you have a gemish of T cells, you may have some that fight the tumor, but some that cause toxicity in the, in the host. So the TILs and the VSTs, if you like, introduced specificity into this approach. However, they're not applicable, obviously, to all cancers. 
and they weren't always potent enough. And so some of us thought, and for me it was in the early 90s, or actually in 89, going to MIT saying, we've got to engineer these cells, which I should say many people scoffed at at the time. For that, you need an efficient method to introduce genes into cells, and today we can even do better. We can edit the cells. I suppose we'll come back to that later. And you needed appropriate receptors to target the T cell, and perhaps not only to target it, but to augment its potency. And so, as you probably all know, there are two ways to target the T cell. One is to use the natural receptor for antigen, which is called the T cell receptor. And then the other one is a group of uh, synthetic molecules that had different names in the beginning, and actually we introduced the term of CAR, so it, I would stop people at conferences and say, no, don't say T-body, don't say SEER, don't, they had various names. And this name uh, stuck, and now encompasses a broad family of receptors that we've classified in first, second, third generation, and, and several other variants of that. And the advantage of that, of these receptors, is that you can take anybody's T cells, whether they have a pre-existing immune response or not. You don't have to go and fish out the few cells that they may have that are tumor-specific or virus-specific from their blood. You can uh, generate very quickly T cells that are targeted to whatever you want. Furthermore, if you go with CARs rather than TCRs, uh, you are not restricted by HLA. And that means that the way the CAR sees antigen is independent of the genetic background of the patient. You probably know the TCR sees antigen in a way that's linked to the unique genetics of every patient. And that can be dealt with, of course, but the CAR is even more convenient because it sees anything on the tumor cell. So CD19 has become the poster child for this technology. It's very useful for um, leukemias and lymphomas. And I guess we'll talk about soon about where we can go from here. Right, wonderful introduction, thank you. So um, trying to put all that into one frame, it's, it's more like a jigsaw puzzle being put together. Pieces from here, autologous cells from a, a patient, a lentiviral vector, GMP, the appropriate CAR cassette, mm -hmm. the appropriate cell processing. So what we have here is a unbelievably thoughtful, sp specific strategy, but one that requires uh, a completely different manufacturing paradigm. So Oz, maybe you could talk about taking this great science and moving it forward in a way that addresses or at least realizes this, this complex manufacturing infrastructure. Yeah, so Michelle described very eloquently how the field has progressed uh, over a period of time and also very rapidly accelerated in the scientific and clinical thinking. In parallel, probably to add to Michelle's comments, would be the last five to ten years has seen an explosion in understanding of how do you actually take these autologous processes, certainly to start with, and get these to a GMP grade level of thinking. And I think that's where um, players like Novartis and others have come in uh, in the past few years is what do we bring is, the, is that thinking and know-how and developing that expertise, not just ourselves, but realizing this is too big for one company to do on its own. And I think that's the story of cell and gene therapies as a whole, that this is uh, an ecosystem, as I like to call it, that's been developed over the past couple of years. And I think in this sector, will continue to develop. Right. Um, certainly, you have to kind of put your own biases and lessons learned from small molecules and biologics. This is a very different way of manufacturing and delivering therapies to patients. Um, so if you think about it, you know, if you look at the CAR-T space, what are you really doing? You are taking uh, disease cells from a child or an adult with leukemia lymphoma. You have to figure out a way to capture those T cells and harvest them and make sure that they're of a decent grade and quality. You then have to think about, do you uh, send them in a fresh manner? Do you cryopreserve them? How do you get them to a cell processing facility? how you then genetically transduce and modify to express the chimeric antigen, how do you then ensure that you've done the right analytics and QC testing to ensure that product's safe and it's going to remain viable, how do you package that, how do you then send that back and ensure the patient actually gets a clinical outcome and then follow them up. So that's a very different business model and a very different way of thinking about science, right, uh, when it comes to the traditional drug de development paradigm. So I think we're now in an era where we're learning, literally building the plane and flying it, to be honest. Right. And if I think I had my colleagues from other companies here on stage, they would probably say the same as me in that regard. Right. That it's been an explosion of science, uh, an explosion of uh, clinical outcomes that have been unprecedented, right? 
especially when you look at some of the populations that the CAR therapies are, are really, truly transformative and, I, and potentially, dare I say, curative one day. Um, it's a field that's rapidly increased, but a lot more to do. This is a field that's still in its infancy in many ways. We, we, we're getting the building blocks right here from a manufacturing science perspective and linking clinical outcome, manufacturing science, quality by design, and also having an ability to rapidly innovate as uh, new cars and new technologies come in, that's going to be the key opportunity and challenge as well for us in the field. Right. So, B Michelle, before we move to the, the opportunities, if you will, of, of where this is taking us and, and how to think about improvements here, maybe you could talk a little bit, because this, quote, first generation process has developed and is the, is the vehicle for some very, very exciting uh, new programs. And so maybe with your uh, second hat on as a scientific founder of Juno, you could talk a little bit about uh, where collectively the space is from a um, clinical development perspective and what you think some of the timelines are going to be for um, potential product registrations, at least in the United States, around, um, around these strategies. I'm not sure I can address or answer anyway every question you've asked. And also I should add that I am primarily an investigator at Sloan Kettering and I cannot be taken to be a, an official uh, speaker on behalf of Juno. So noted. Um, but um, I first want to pick up from two words, two very heavy, heavy, heavy words that Oz uh, used, uh, transformative and curative. Um, I actually believe this is transformative, and it's not, you know, we all write grants and there's always a call for something transformative in your uh, application, your new idea. <clears throat> but I just want to stress that the results obtained with uh, CD19 CAR therapy, particularly <clears throat> in the leukemias, which was pioneered in adults at Sloan Kettering and in children at, at CHOP at, at the University of Pennsylvania, are transformative not because or not only because of the very high rate of complete remissions. Um, you probably know there are 80 to 90 percent remissions in patients with relapsed and chemorefractory disease. If I may say, they, they are nearly dead patients. They will not respond to any more chemotherapy. You would not even attempt a bone marrow transplantation at that point because it, it, we know it wouldn't work. And so <clears throat> it's at this point that in these phase one trials, uh, it was demonstrated that CD19 CAR, CAR therapy works. And the message here is that cells have worked where chemicals, i.e. classic drugs, have failed. And I think that's the power of the story. Agreed. Great news for leukemia patients, but something that is an, achieved on a completely different level using cells and not chemicals. And I think that's the, the basis of the transformation. And the curative aspect, obviously, is that uh, many of us in the immunotherapy space for years have been at least fantasizing that immune responses, um, because they are cell-mediated and because through evolution T cells have acquired so many tricks to infiltrate tissues, to persist, to recruit help, to enroll all kinds of processes of inflammation that we could um, eventually uh, aim for a curative therapy, and, and that's really what drives us too. And that's why when a few years back people said, even if this worked, it would be perhaps too expensive to, to implement, that economically it may not be viable. The thought had always had been, yes, but wait a minute. If we're curative, and not just inducing responses and then everybody relapses or at six or 12 or 18 months, this would make the difference. So we don't know whether we're there yet, but there are some data that are starting to mature now right. that hints that at least in a few cases this therapy may be indeed curative, and that's another very and powerful maybe, moment. Maybe briefly talk about where we're seeing the most success and what the timelines are for possible registrations. Yeah. For so the, uh, and that was your initial question, well CD19 became the paradigm. Um, mm -hmm. We chose it for a number of reasons leukemia, lymphomas, unmet need, possibly on the tumor-initiating cells. We also thought maybe CARs would be immunogenic, and so if we knocked out the B cells that you know express CD19, we didn't know, so we just thought it might help that. And interestingly, several other groups, when they decided to try out a CAR therapy, they went for the same target. In a way, we were surprised, flattered, and in the end, it has been a tremendous thing. 
because um, results, uh, outstanding results, were reported from many centers, right. or at least many, I would say three, <laughs> to be precise, uh, the NCI, UPenn, and us. And I think, therefore, the results were immediately embraced. You know, had you had only one team claiming three patients somewhere, you might have said, well, let's wait till there's more. Mm -hmm. But at about the same time, everybody was coming up with this. Now, at the same time, there's little variations. So it's all the CD19 car therapy, but there are little variations in the manufacturing, the cars, the conditioning, the types of patients, the many B-cell malignancies that exist. And that has generated an enormous wealth of information. And so it turns out really, it's worked out really well. Now, the consequence of this is that most of our knowledge is with CD19. Perhaps oddly, but for that reason, we know not so much about you know, where this could be applied to we, or where it could work. We know it can be applied to many, many cancers, but this is just starting now, you know, in the last year, and so, so we're going to find out more. So in terms of approvals, finally, <laughs> well, um, as you know, there are pivotal trials that have uh, begun, initiated by Novartis as well as by Juno, and um, I think, that I certainly hope personally that 2017 will be a very big year for that. I wonder what Oz thinks. Yeah, I would concur with what Michelle says. 2017 is going to be a, hopefully, a very important year for patients and this community. I think uh, at least two or three um, possible registrations in 17, I think, is looking forward. So, so Oz, let's take um, up from one of the points Michelle made in terms of you know, the perception of, of, of a costly mm -hmm. process, process, product, and, and, but justified by potential clinical outcome. What strategies do you think are, are front and center for second generation manufacturing approaches, strategies to try and begin to address what's a fairly complicated autologous cell therapy program? Sure, so, and I think it's, it's important to ground this audience in particular, we're still really building generation one. So generation one has not fully declared success yet, right? No, I mean, that's gonna um, be the basis for these And that's exactly the points that right. I think Michelle was cautioning as well, that we are building this um, infrastructure, we're building the, the basics of how you will commercialize these products and make them available, not just in the US, but globally. So assuming that this is all done uh, in the next couple of years, and I, and I believe it will happen, yeah. um, we're then looking at the future generations in terms of, and I, I'll focus more, I think we're gonna talk specifically on the scientific components, but let's talk about the question you asked, which is uh, cost of goods scale, how do you manage this moving forward? So I, I think I can speak for others in, the, in, in this field right now that as much time as we spend incessantly focusing on CD19 and getting regulators and stakeholders comfortable with the story from a benefit risk perspective. After all, let's face it, we had some misses in the, in the cell and gene therapy space over the years. And so now there will be, um, you're in an environment of um, extreme, I would say, FDA uh, receptivity and appetite to these therapies. Um, many of you, I, I would encourage you to look at the RAC meeting last week, I think Michelle, you may have been there two weeks ago, when uh, FDA start to talk about very openly, and the RAC in particular, about uh, databases being set up to look at this data more in real time and really assess benefit risk. Why do they want to do that? Because they know this is going to be uh, addressing unprecedented unmet medical need, and the agencies are really, really excited as much as we are about this. It's, it's not often you, you have that experience in your career where regulators are are so drawn to, to the mission and cause of what you're doing as well. Um, in parallel to all of this and the, the environment right now, uh, a lot of focus going on on cost of goods. These therapies are expensive to manufacture, there's no doubt about it. But like all new innovation that comes forward, initially cost of goods are high. If we go back to the early era of biologics 20, 30 years ago, nobody could believe that we would have now sustainable and scalable models for biologics. I mean, I remember very well those discussions in the early days right. about building, uh, you know, very, very large facilities to be able to handle biologic demand. And uh, the world is a very different place now. But initially, those cost of goods were high. True. And it was a period of probably, I would, going back, biologics, first five, seven years post-approval when real investments were made on uh, scalability and bringing down cost of goods. So in our business, for autologous therapy, certainly you're relying on a throughput of a number of patients uh, coming through the system, but also specifically look at the worlds that we're playing with CAR-T therapy. There's a lot of progressive science going on on the viral vector side. 
So we now have um, groups like Oxford Biosciences and others that are, are really developing good expertise in this area, world-class expertise, I would say, that are now looking to take the viral vector technologies to the next level. How do you get from, say, you know, doing a, a two-hit uh, approach to a viral vector transduction to one? How do you improve your suspensions? How do you look at uh, the whole gamut of improvability, if I can call it that, around uh, viral vectors? At the same time, automation. Automation is going to be key. And there are many, many groups in the room today that have that expertise that are partnering with many companies to define front end and back end what does automation look like. Um, there are other aspects in terms of, and Michelle uh, touched on this, that every uh, player in the car space has nuances and subtleties in the process, uh, be they around the media that's used, be that in around the way T cells are harvested or extracted, how the cells are grown. All of these components cost resources and right now are quite resource intense. But there will come a time when those resources will be less intense because we will have figured out what right. is required um, to really slim these down. So in our world, as much excitement as we have about getting the first building blocks baked, all of us uh, in this space are looking very aggressively to how do you address in parallel cost of goods and thinking about actually testing the right. outcomes. So in, in our world, um, it's not like traditional drug development, right, in terms of a sequential drug development process. We've discovered, and any group that deals with this space understands the cellular microenvironment is so unique for different patient types. And so having an understanding that if you make a manufacturing change, how is that going to influence clinical outcome is a big, big key area that we're all working on right now. So as well as your pivotal studies, how do you develop a mechanism where you're able to look and test out process improvement and process optimization in, in disease cells, but outside of the pivotal machine? Yeah. Yeah. So something that I would call the sort of non-pivotal setting and, and developing capabilities in that and rapidly introducing those process changes into your existing manufacturing right. base and getting FDA and others buying into that. Not simple. So these are just some thoughts in terms of the, the opportunities, but challenges as well. Right. And initially, cost of goods will be high. Uh, Michelle said it very well. I think outcomes are yet to be fully determined. If those outcomes hold out uh, and you are able to improve the quality of life of a child and a family that are going to be, frankly, facing no other choice. I mean, Michelle painted the narrative. These are relapsing refractory patients who have no other hope. And so what price are you willing to pay in a reasonable setting for an outcome that would allow that individual to enjoy a full quality of life? And it's an ongoing debate. It's not going to be an easy debate, right? Yeah. Because these are uh, the challenges for innovators in terms of the investments we make, uh, but then also uh, a trade-off in terms of how do we ensure that systems of healthcare aren't broken. We're not doing this to break healthcare systems I believe, with exuberant costs on these therapies. So we have an obligation also in parallel to figure out how do we get these therapies more controlled in terms of cost base and manufacturing and make them even more sustainable and scalable for future years. So, so Michelle, that's a, a, Oz gave us a great discussion of, of the potential evolution of the process. Let's talk about the evolution of the product, right? So at some level, we're uh, wonderfully uh, in a first generation sort of environment, talked about manufacturing and, and process. G give us your crystal ball of, of three years, five years, 10 years out. What are the sorts of, of opportunities to improve specificity, to improve efficiency, uh, to broaden the, the indication base? Uh, what are some of the levers that one wants to pull in that, in that way? Actually, you touched on the three um, key main directions when you said specificity, uh, efficacy, and, and broadening. So, <clears throat> so we've learned from the um, CD19 uh, car experience that uh, autologous T cells that have been genetically modified to target CD19 and, and revved up in some way uh, uh, through the car itself can have profound effects in chemorefractory uh, diseases. There's a hierarchy between those diseases. ALL, acute lymphoblastic leukemia, is notoriously the one that responds the best. That was not expected. I, I think we, I can speak for other investigators in the field. Nobody started with ALL, actually, including ourselves. 
Uh, but it turns out that's where the results are the best. Yeah. And the results are also very good in, in various lymphomas and in chronic lymphocytic leukemias, um, but a, a little bit less good. And that's the same target, the same manufacturing approach, and yet there's a difference between the diseases. So that's telling you already something that this, you cannot extrapolate from one disease to the other. And if the target is the same, CD19, uh, then the difference lies elsewhere, and it probably lies in this famous microenvironment. You know, a tumor is not just cancer cells. A tumor, uh, an old Latin word, I guess, is, is made up of tumor cells, but a whole bunch of uh, uh, inflammatory cells, blood vessels, even sometimes nerves and, and lymphatics. And all of that microenvironment uh, where the tumor uh, thrives tends to limit immune responses, and we've also learned that from checkpoint blockade therapy. So we know we have to design T cells that will overcome or overpower that microenvironment. So the three points. One is specificity, I'll say finding the right targets. Finding the right targets to drive this technology to solid tumors is something that many academic groups and companies are actively pursuing. It's not as simple as you would think. You can't just go to the, your, your favorite journal and pick a bunch of reviews and then say bing, 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 no. Because we have very specific requirements for these targets. Because these cells are so powerful, okay, they are extremely powerful. <laughs> they can destroy also any normal tissue that expresses that target. So we have to be clever in which targets we choose and how we design the T-cell. And there are certainly in the literature plenty of ideas in the preclinical stage to achieve that. So finding the right targets. Secondly, designing the T-cell in a way that it will overcome that microenvironment. And as Oz already implied, it's not the same for every tumor and perhaps not the same for every patient. Having said that, there are dominant rules, there are dominant mechanisms, and gradually in the field of tumor immunology, a picture is emerging, so we kind of have a sense of which ones may be more important than others. And obviously, we're designing T cells that are designed to, to that, that we want to target the tumor and overcome those specific barriers. And the third one is broadening, as you said, and, and perhaps that's a segue to the um, allogeneic approaches yes. that I, I think you wanted to discuss. So those are the three big directions. There are others and sub-themes, but perhaps in a simplified manner, which I, I think reflects the reality. Right, no, that's very That's right. the three big things to do at this point. Right. And, and that is a good segue for us to come full circle from uh, an autologous cell therapy approach and the challenges and, and developments there, and then technically the ability to augment or change from a second or third generation product to move to something that has uh, less cumbersome manufacturing issues and potentially faster uh, and evolved uh, capabilities for patients. So Oz, maybe you could talk a little bit about second, third generation, but within the, in the context of Allo. Sure, so um, it's, a, it's a very exciting area, right? The rapid evolution with gene editing. I mean, gene editing is nothing new, but uh, clearly the advent of uh, CRISPR technology is clearly taking front and center stage. But I would say that there's still a lot uh, that can be translated with uh, uh, zinc finger nucleases, talons, and the wide armamentarians of the field you know very well, Ed. Um, what I think, in my, and this is my own opinion, I think autologous therapies will form the beachhead from the scientific thinking, the regulatory thinking, uh, and certainly for the next few years, it really is going to be an autologous play. But innovation doesn't stop. And so all our groups uh, are clearly looking at allogeneic technologies. How do we do that? In, in our company, we have a relationship with Intellia. Uh, we, we're using CRISPR uh, technology right now with our research colleagues to look at not just CART technologies, but we're looking at sickle cell disease and other areas of interest for us from a portfolio perspective. Um, the challenges are going to be really in terms of, uh, while the, the storyboard of precision, balancing that really with translating to a proof of concept, getting uh, the issue of um, graft versus host disease eliminated if you're going to an allogeneic platform and knocking out those uh, uh, T cell receptors in a way where you still get the benefit of an allogeneic heart, but uh, obviating the, the, the natural concern one would have with allogeneic pooling of of blood cells, particularly T cells, uh, with regards to graft versus host disease. 
But there is a tremendous prolific science occurring on this very, very rapidly. The challenge is getting this into a proof of concept, and I look forward to seeing groups bringing this into the clinic uh, as a next phase. A lot of great work being done by many groups, Selectus, um, other companies as well, our own as well, included uh, you know, Juno Kite, all looking at the next generation. So that's on the allergenic front, but as Michelle already po pointed out, this issue of potency and specificity, there's still a lot of work to do to refine the existing cart targets that we have, uh, building up and developing better carts, carts that um, maybe lead to better durability and persistence, for example. We think we have a good basis for that with CD19 carts now, but still need to develop longer-term outcomes data. Um, and <laughs> Michelle said it, these are incredibly powerful, powerful cells. Uh, when you transduce them. Let's not forget, there are, there are risks with these therapies as well. Uh, as, as many of you will know, one of, the, one of the side effects of these therapies is developing cytokine release, where you have such overwhelming, powerful cell expansion with the destruction of tumor, especially in, in patients that have high tumor burden, leading to toxins and release. And uh, luckily, we found a way with all the different groups to manage this uh, with uh, interleukin antagonists. But it shows you that there's a, there's a way here where you also need to modulate the effect of potency. Potency and powerful isn't always a good thing, right? You've got to have that measured. You have to control. A lot of work being done with on-off switches, as you know, rheostat switches. Right. Um, Michelle, I know, uh, has, a, has a strong interest in armored cars and, and other areas of development. Likewise, in our teams, we're looking very aggressively as to what are those mechanisms for second and third generation, particularly the on-off switches, uh, to make those an even better for benefit risk profile um, to ensure that we optimize the safety component of these very, very powerful therapies. So I hope I gave you a flavor of yeah, the different did. areas, but it really is a, for us, it's an autologous build with a view that allergenic therapies could happen, and we welcome the science. We're also in invested in that, and let's see how the data speaks one day. Certainly pros science. and cons uh, yeah. there. Well, let's use that as a transition, Michelle, to, to maybe thinking about solid tumors. And, you know, um, Oz mentioned armored cars as the as a as a soundbite that has been used to think about extension into you know, much larger number of patients potentially in the solid tumor space. And can you talk about the technology evolution or strategy for that? Um, sure, with pleasure. So yes, the 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 term we've used of armored cars really was to um, you just find a formula to express the notion that um, you can introduce uh, into a T-cell not just the CAR gene, but, but additional genes. Current, technology, current technologies uh, allow you to introduce three genes into T-cells. Four, I'm sure we'll get there at some point. Five, six, seven, eight will probably follow. But at this time, um, two genes has been done, and three is probably going to be done very, very soon. So you, you have a little more latitude on this platform of T-cell engineering to, to, to provide more instructions to the T-cells so that they can do a better job, again, uh, fighting the tumor. So one gene could be the one coding for the car. And then you've got two other slots there that you can use, if you like, to, to again, deliver some instruction. And that's the armored part, is that we're, we're introducing additional functions into those T-cells um, that targets certain mechanisms that we know to be common in, in tumor uh, immune escape. So for example, you can express a cytokine. Um, some of them have a, a long history of, of 20 years, but they couldn't always be developed in the clinic. And I'm thinking of IL-12 as an example here, because some cytokines, which are very powerful, cannot be administered systemically because of their toxicity. You know, the levels that you need, if you're giving them uh, intravenously as protein, is such that you're going to have toxicities. But now, if you deliver them, if you think about the T cell as a delivery vehicle, a, a localized, targeted delivery vehicle, now you can hope that you can raise a local concentration that could be very active in a tumor without incurring the systemic toxicities. So that's one of the um, uh, ideas in those armored cars. Uh, another ap approach makes use of ligands for certain receptors that we introduce into these T cells. And uh, we and others too have shown that some of particular ligands, which may be natural or synthetic again, can really rev up the immune response locally within the tumor microenvironment. So that's another type of armored car. Another one that we're beginning to explore, uh, at Sloan Kettering anyway, 
makes use of the cell to secrete antibodies. So rather than a combination therapy where you have a CAR T cell and you're delivering an antibody, now use that T cell again as a vehicle for secreting uh, a form of the antibody. And that's really what, what is the concept of these uh, um, armored cars, if you like. So it's a car plus one or two other things that target m resistance mechanisms uh, in, in, in the tumor microenvironment. So there's, there's a lot of things that are interesting. There's a lot of things that are probably worth testing, but you can only do so much. Right. And this is where we see the role of an academic center like ours. Um, we have established our own GMP operation. Right. Uh, we can manufacture cells. Uh, a few other centers in the U.S. Uh, can do that, and hopefully more and more will be able to do that. And we see our role as testing these ideas in phase one trials. Well, let's, um, in the five minutes we have left, let's come back to that and, and, and Oz for Novartis. So Sloan Kettering, enormous uh, success, infrastructure capabilities, Juno with a 1.2 billion dollars on its balance sheet. If you were going to compete with Sloan Kettering or with Juno, where would you focus? Well, I don't know if I'll compete with Sloan Kettering. <laughs> Maybe you will. <laughs> but, but where are some of the opportunities that, I mean, there's so much going on at Novartis. There's so much going on in your lab and Juno and the progress you've so, made. But, you know, so, where, where, I mean, do, do other companies in this space uh, have a chance? I can't sure. speak, well, I can't speak for other companies, but here's what we're doing. Um, we've um, increased our, our, our manufacturing uh, capacity. Uh, we have a facility now that's, uh, again, a few blocks from here with, with nine suites where we can culture patients' cells. And uh, right now we're, we're making 70 or 80 products per year and we might go to up to about 100. Um, space is limited in Manhattan. There's only so much that we can do. But with that, we can probably run, we're right now running eight clinical trials, eight phase one clinical trials. If something looks good, we think we should then transfer it to Juno. And Juno should bring it to a multi-center study and hopefully further refine it and bring it to the market. We see our role as testing these uh, different ideas, uh, evaluating their, their efficacy and safety to the extent that you can in 10 or 12 patients in the context of a phase one trial. If it looks promising, it should be transferred to, to the Good. company. If we see that issues, we can tweak it, we can go back, change something in the construct or the approach or the manufacturing process. And as Oz said before, and I wanna stress that, the FDA um, is so understanding of that. It's really a working partner. Yes. I, I think we yes. can say that that they are they're fans of this approach. They do their job, which is to protect the patient. Uh, that has not changed. Uh, but they really want to see this happen. So sometimes within a, 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 a protocol, we'll make a change. Right. Or if not, we'll go back to the drawing board. And if the next iteration works better, then that one will go to the well, company. And that's the beauty of a phase one, two study. So Oz, you're teleported out of Novartis. You have to compete with Novartis and Juno and, and so on. Where are the opportunities to, uh, to move forward with new approaches? So I think that there will be opportunities. So let me just reground a little bit that um, like Michelle said, uh, this ecosystem between uh, academic centers with credibility when it comes to GMP grade facilities, Nora Sloan Kettering, Penn, others, uh, you know, Kite User, uh, NCI, and uh, Steve Rosenberg's group. So that, that is a given in this space. And if you look at the three companies that are clearly investing the heaviest in this space, that's the model we're all using. Rapid testing, proof of concept, something hits, get it transferred to a pivotal machine in a, in a company. Right. Um, so that's the model that is now working. We see that coming through with data and new targets. Um, as you then start to think about um, the future vision here, I mean, companies like Novartis didn't do this just for the short term. So when we had a vision to get into this business, it was really, look, there is a reality that small molecules and biologics are always gonna be there. Um, but there will be a third pillar of medicine, whether we like it or not, in some shape or form, in terms of cell and gene therapies. How big that is gonna be, nobody knows right now. Um, but if you 
make that assumption that fundamentally in the next 10 years the practice of medicine will be transformed, that this will be a modality and an armamentarium that appropriately um, set up sites and physicians around the globe can utilize for certain patient populations. If you assume that we will move from refractory relapsing populations and move into second first line possibly one day, as you start to think about other hematological malignancies, et cetera. And for the record, for solid tumors, we're still learning, right? We have had um, evidence that's publicly published out there with certain targets that we see carts trafficking and entering tumor sites, right. but no pharmacodynamic response yet. So we're clearly developing better car designer cars for solid tumors is something everybody's really looking at aggressively. If you assume that all of these things pan out, then I do believe if I was looking at the outside as an opportunity for this sector, for sure. There are, there are gonna be ample opportunities moving forward. But the beachhead is really gonna be created by hematological malignancies. Agreed. And, and that's, that's just the way it is. We all wish there were other targets on top, but I think they will come with time. Yeah. Well, that's and a I would great say, yeah, from an investor standpoint, this will remain an attractive space um, for new and additional therapies to come play. Uh, it's not just about cars, it's about T-cell receptor technologies right. and other types of technology in the cell therapy space. So I would, uh, looking outside, and yes, there's opportunities. Good. So please join me in thanking the panel for a very, very informative discussion. Thank, thank, thank you, Brian. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Michelle. Thanks,